and welcome. You're watching the Right to Be Heard Town Hall. So far on the program, we've had chief ministers, senior ministers in the union cabinet, and each one of them has blamed the opposition for derailing the India growth story. The government says we've got the right ideas, but the opposition plays an obstructionist role, doesn't allow us to implement those ideas. So today, on the Right to Be Heard Town Hall, we are joined by leader of the opposition in the Rajya Sabha, senior BJP leader, Mr. Arun Jaitley. Thank you very much, Mr. Jaitley, for joining us on the Right to Be Heard Town Hall. We've got lots of people ready to start questioning him. I want the gentleman there in the corner to begin by asking the first question. Uh, Mr. Jaitley, uh, there seems to be an impression that news channels, the press and NGOs play the role of the opposition while you play the role of the obstruction. Why is it so? Well, if somebody wants to take the credit for being a larger opposition in this country to what I consider a failed government, I am quite willing to concede that role to them. Because uh, if the people are opposing this government, the media is uh, critical of it, it's quite welcome. But as far as the opposition parties are concerned, particularly us, we've been in the forefront of all this. Parliamentary opposition obviously comes... Uh, from the opposition in parliament and we are the largest party. The largest number of protests, be it economic issues, be it issues of corruption, come from us. Now of late there has been a great disillusionment with the functioning of the government, particularly on issues like corruption. And you see large parts of the citizenry, which is otherwise not politically connected with any party, also on the streets. They also have a very important role to play. I concede that role to them. But to say that we don't perform that opposition perhaps may not be a correct assessment. No, but this is something which has been said by almost every single person who sat in the same chair as you, that the government has a reform agenda. The opposition is constantly trying to derail it. They have no creative solutions of their own. They are trying to stemmy the Indian growth story by derailing whatever the government Where is to. the reform agenda? From 91 to 9, 2004, I can quite understand that there was a reform agenda in this country. Post-2004, for a couple of years, on the impetus of the past policies, the economy continued. But then post-2004, you hardly had a reform agenda. The government was involved in entirely different kind of exercise, even on socio-economic issues. And it had abandoned the path that was there from 91 to 2004 onwards. Now, who prevented this government from taking decisions? Policy paralysis, that's a phrase now internationally used for this government was not because of this opposition. Nobody told them, please slow down the, uh, uh, the infrastructure creation in this country. How many projects are held up uh, because uh, there, is a, there is a battle going on between the environment ministry and the concerned departments uh, which have to undertake those projects, also the finance ministry. You had success stories. The highways was a success story. The telecom was a success story. And you had corruption completely derailing those success stories. Therefore, for them to say the opposition came in the way. In fact, the earlier question was uh, uh, a little stricture on us saying you are not doing enough. And your question is completely to the contrary that you are obstructing it. None of these steps were obstructed by us. You had a virtually paralyzed government. And therefore, if there are economic issues on which we have a difference of opinion, we are certainly entitled to express that opinion. Okay. That lady has a question. Just to follow up uh, from the first question, uh, I think since 1989, we are having oppositional majority in the Rajya Sabha. So why doesn't the opposition uh, parties, they use this in a more constructive way and come out, you know, set the agenda uh, with some kind of legislat for legislative action? This is my first question. And second is, uh, I think after the defeat of the 2004 elections, BJP's defeat, uh, don't you think BJP is facing a kind of identity crisis, whether to go back to ethno-religious issues of Ram Mandir or to stick to developmental issues which uh, Narendra Modi is propagating. Thank you. Not in the least. I'll tell you, you've asked uh, two questions. First of all, opposition doesn't have a majority in the Rajya Sabha. The UPA is in a minority, but the balance of power is held by two political parties which are quite easily tackleable by the UPA. That's the SP and the BSP. Therefore, who has a majority in the Rajya Sabha is anybody's guess. Now, we have been making suggestions. Are you aware of the fact that most legislations are passed almost with unanimity? But then, obviously, there will be one or two out of ten on which there is a difference of opinion. The parliamentary standing committees make recommendations and therefore, a large number of them are unanimous. And therefore, the legislative agenda really doesn't suffer. But most of the economic agenda in this country is non-legislative in character. And therefore, to implement that non-legislative economic agenda, 
and that's also your earlier question it's really the initiative and the leadership which the government itself has to show secondly when you say bjp has an identity crisis that's not correct we ran a very successful government for 6 years in this country and we have every party has multiple issues no one issue itself uh, uh, can really be reflective of your entire personality and therefore you may have an issue which you may have uh, certain social or cultural issues on which you have a position you may have a position on economic issues no but the yeah, question but mr jaitley can i ask him a question on this economic issues you know more than once today you've said that you know economic agenda economic reforms many believe there is little to distinguish between the economic agenda or the economic policies of the indian national congress and the bharatiya janata party what is the difference in the economic policies of See, the two both of you have a right wing neo liberal kind of a economic policy agenda you see yes on many issues of liberalization this country is moving towards a larger consensus if you see the post 91 experiment in this country and if i may just de define the parameters of this you need much larger growth rates in this country we are conscious of the fact that with those expanding growth rates itself won't solve the problem because the poverty base is very large in this country from those with enriched steps that the enriched revenues that the government has the governments may have their own concept of what kind of poverty alleviation schemes you want and you will uh, you you may have differences of opinion now the how do you achieve that growth process do you achieve it by a pre 91 model or a post 91 model to that extent there may be a broader consensus but within that consensus there will be several steps on which you probably don't agree with each other okay this gentleman has a question yeah go on uh, hello uh, arun ji uh, i just wanted to uh, add to what uh, he has mentioned in the context of the stand of the bjp on many issues being inconsistent with uh, what it was when the bjp was a ruling party the up the the nda was the ruling party and the stand now uh, particularly on issues like uh, nuclear power fdi fdi i think the stand has changed quite a lot well, let me let me cl clarify to you as far as fdi is concerned fdi always can be an additionality of resource as far as the country is concerned and therefore neither the nda or the bjp then or today is opposed to the concept of fdi which are the sectors in which you will welcome it and which are the sectors which are to be protected there may be a difference of opinion now as far as retail is concerned even when the nda was in power we were i was the commerce minister for a brief while and therefore consistently in our negotiation with foreign companies foreign governments in the wto we were very clear that time was not right for india to open fdi in retail and that's why we didn't do it there were discussions within the government and we consciously took a sta stand that we must step back as far as the steps are concerned therefore to say that we were wanting to open it at that stage was not correct there were suggestions which came in the nda also at some stage Mr Maran had once mooted a suggestion as a commerce minister with my predecessor but then when it goes to the cabinet the collective wisdom was against this at that stage UPA 2 is in a major crisis Mr Arun Jaitley over DMK insisting that Yeh Raja to be heard in the joint parliamentary committee what is the you know role of opposition in that BJP how would BJP members in JPC would act number 1 number 2 about your friend Justice Kadju I want to ask you one question now today he has gone on Pakistan media and he has also criticized the narendra modi's government well perhaps he feels he gets a better audience there so he's willing to <laughs> <laughs> go and address those audiences but uh, coming to your first question you see a jpc is a serious parliamentary committee it's a parliamentary probe into a particular matter now when somebody says and somebody may be on the receiving end of a jpc report is already an accused and he says i want to be heard I'm sure the JPC will take a fair view as far as his right to be heard is concerned. Uh, I have no personal opinion to express because I am not a member of the JPC. It's only proper that members of the JPC speak on it. But I see it. Uh, uh, I don't see a serious reason why somebody can decline to hear. In it. the case, P. Chidambaram and P. Prime Minister will be summoned. That's what also. Well, that's a matter for the JPC to decide, and therefore it's not proper for me, being a part of Parliament, to comment on what's within the JPC jurisdiction. On Justice Kadju. i am straight away conceding to him and others like him a right to have an opinion i have no difficulty if somebody criticizes me or mr narendra modi or the bjp the very large section of the world which criticizes us my only difficulty is on a matter of propriety and the propriety is 
either sitting judges or former judges in judicial or quasi judicial positions should they participate actively in politics like issuing electoral appeals and so on or should they maintain a distance can the chief justice of india say that in the evening after i get up from court i am now a private citizen i am entitled to participate in politics and make these comments there is a certain amount of discipline no sitting or retired judge of the supreme court has ever done it but then justice kartu is a little unconventional what is it that the bjp as the principal opposition party stands for there is one ideology which pushes for the ram mandir and says the main agenda of the party is to ensure that there is a ram mandir built in ayodhya then there is a center of right party uh, center right party which we see on occasions in flashes but then we don't know because that party also opposes it. that gentleman said some of the decisions that the nda was trying to push through earlier what in today's context mr jetley is the definition of what it is that the bjp stands what is the definition of your channel don't you have 30 programs sure. therefore to say that you are only identified by one program now a political party may have an economic agenda it may have a view on certain social issues it may have a view on reservation it may have a view on certain cultural issues or on uh, historical issues and therefore to say please tell me which is the one which is your identity and therefore it wipes out everything else that's not so proper. how do you define the bjp and what it stands for well bjp is a is an important political party which is a part of india's uh, uh, democratic politics bjp is a party which uh, would like to see india as an extremely prosperous nation bjp is a party which is proud of india's cultural heritage and therefore we are not ashamed to identify ourselves with it and therefore even when it comes to an issue like ram mandir how we are able to achieve whether it's through a judicial process or a settlement is a separate question but we do stand committed to it okay uh, that lady wants to ask a question yes nctc can help in combating terrorism but uh, bjp is opposing it that's uh, why sir well that's that's a wrong con concept we have first of all let's understand how terrorism is to be contained now to contain terrorism and the kind of terrorism that you have in india you have the maoist insurgency you have a problem in northeast you have domestic modules of jihadi terrorism you have uh, cross border terrorism now under our constitutional system you have two important aspects the defense and sovereignty of india are the prime responsibility of the central government law and order police is the exclusive domain of the state government that's the indian constitution that's the federalism now terrorism has to be contained in light of both as far as uh, cross border terrorism is concerned it's the capacity and the ability of the central government to really get that intelligence as far as interstate intelligence is concerned because several terrorist organizations may have national modules is the responsibility of the central government but policing is the only and exclusive responsibility of the state government now to say that you will have counter terrorism center which will have an intelligence grid fair enough i have no difficulty we will share intelligence very good there is no difficulty but the operational part that is searching people arresting people prosecuting those people now that's a police function now the moment you say the police function belongs to the central government i am afraid you are altering the indian constitution that can't be done therefore you should need not have a meaningless debate like uh, terrorism versus federalism it's a joint responsibility no, of both Jethi, the governments it's not a meaningless debate because we've seen for example in the united states yes. because they worked together they were able to combat terrorism don't you think when it comes the to american one ncdc terrorist... and mr chidambaram borrowed the idea from yes. the american ncdc the american ncdc is an intelligence collecting and a processing center operational power even in america is not with the ncdc and that's the only difficulty i have with the ncdc no because on issues like terrorism states and course you have to work, to work together. together everybody is so bothered about their own turfs and their own domains Rahul, that Rahul, they're not looking at the larger national picture of course picture. let's be specific of course you have to work together therefore the ncdc should not take the police operational power in its own domain and keep the states out after all it's the states which have to which have the but police now the government has said they are prepared to make certain changes which will ensure well, that the state police sure, does not feel sure, left out i am sure if the government creates an nctc within the constitutional framework respecting the power of the states there is no reason why anybody would be opposed to it okay uh, my reaction to this mr jetley there are three reasons for terrorism one of course is the clandestine funding channels second is concentration of illegal arms in ghettos i don't want to mention the as areas and the third is very lengthy slow process of judicial uh, 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 you know uh, uh, trials 
Is there a serious effort by any political party to ensure like America after 9-11 there has been no funding case of militant while it continues to happen in India? That's my one question. Second question is, it is only when a scam of the ruling party is exposed, all of you make a lot of noise. But the corruption is inbuilt in our system in the form of policy, programs. Has there been any sincere effort by you as a leader or opposition party to ensure that our policies, programs become more transparent and accountable? Well, let me very, uh, come on to your first question, which is, which, which, which is a very serious issue which you've raised. Why is it that in the United States of America, post 9-11, there's hardly been a case of uh, a major case of a terrorist attack. And in India, every time there is a terrorist attack, we condemn it and then we wait for the next attack to happen. And that, that's the position that happens in India. I think our national approach on terror has to be very clear. The battle against terror or the war on terror has to go on uninterrupted. You can't interrupt the war and then lower your guards. You cannot afford for any form of terror to in fact dilute your battle. Now I for one feel you, you spoke about the judicial delays in this whole process. There was no reason why India even today should not have an anti-terror law. Europe has it, America has it, and they don't have a fraction of the kind of terrorism problems that we have. Their intelligence network is concentrated on security. What we've done is that we are flittering away our intelligence resource, which is a national resource, and using a very large part of it for political and quasi-political extraneous reasons. We need not do that. You have to concentrate on that. Now, as far as corruption is concerned, I think uh, you are absolutely right. It's eating into our vitals. We still don't have an adequate system of, uh, or a transparent system of political funding in this country. When I was a law minister, we changed it. We not only provide permitted funding by check donations, I took an extraordinary step that says whoever gives by check to that extent will get an income tax deduction so that people are incentivized. Even today I find not more than a small fraction of political funding is coming by check. Countries in Europe, United States, large democracies, every penny of what you spend in politics is accounted for. Now this raises the next issue. How do you collect funds then? You misuse discretions. Then you create mechanisms like uh, 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 investigative agencies which the governments would like to control. And when governments control them, you went to the Supreme Court and that landmark judgment in your own case, where they said make the CBI independent of the government. Effectively, has it happened? We've now spent 17, 18 years after that judgment. The answer is no. You see, performance and secularism, they are going to be the main issues again in the coming elections. The first one you said performance. performance. Secularism and performance. Would Have you really prepared a balance sheet of your own party? in terms of these two bases, or rather would you depend only on the negatives of the ruling party? Not in the least. You see, every party has to go to the people. What do you go on? I think there are three important factors. First will be a question of leadership. What is the kind and quality of leadership that you are projecting? Regrettably, what happens in our case is, because we, we are not a party given to a dynastic democracy, you have a galaxy of leadership. So we'll have uh, in, a, in a particular age bracket a large number of chief ministers, central leaders. So instead of saying that in a proper structured party which must throw up a large number of leaders, oh, this is a problem for you. Second, does the leadership and the party have any credibility, both in terms of its ideology, also in terms of integrity of its leaders and otherwise. Thirdly, in terms of your programs and your performances, so people are going to judge us by the way, our governments do perform. So whether it's Madhya Pradesh or it's Chhattisgarh or it's Gujarat, wherever we have an opportunity to come to power or the NDA government in Bihar, wherever we are performing, we are certainly going to be judged by our performances. Okay. We'll slip into a quick break. Lots of people still waiting to ask questions. Uh, Mr. Jaitley also spoke about the issue of leadership. There are lots of questions on the issue of leadership which await Mr. Jaitley when we come back on the other side of a quick break to the right to Bihar town. I'll be back in a moment.
You're watching the right to be heard town hall. We've got leader of the opposition, the Rajya Sabha, Mr. Arun Jaitley, with us. Neerja will ask first question. Ms. Mr. Jaitley, you spoke about the galaxy of leaders in the BJP, and you are amongst the top two or three today. Um, you have many things going for you. You are the moderate face, open face, clean face in the BJP. Many think you're capable of running any of the four top departments of government. In some ways, you're representative of a new changing middle class urban India. And yet, this is the yet I want to ask you. You have not come across so far as being able to connect with rural India and the perception of being a mass leader. You have not even contested a Lok Sabha election. Now, is this because of an aversion to it? Is this beca because of a strategy or just temperament? Well, all I can tell you, Nirja, is uh, politics and political opportunities are also an art of the possible. Now, in 1999, when I was first asked to join the government of Mr. Vajpayee, I had never contested an election. I had no intention of doing so. In fact, I became a member of parliament six months uh, after becoming a minister. Even prior to that, my responsibility was more in the party, organizing elections, etc. So the party decided accordingly. Hopefully this time they decide otherwise. Would you like to fight the next election? <laughs> Would you like to fight the next elections? Well, if the party decides, certainly. Where from? From Gujarat or from Obviously, Delhi? Obviously, I can't. Uh, what I would can't. you prefer? Gujarat, Delhi, no, no, I'm, I'm safe seat. Is, is Mr. Jaitley cut out for the heat and dust of electoral politics? Well, certainly I would like to contest. I started my career as a young student contesting elections and then I gave it up. As a lawyer, I uh, was working in the party from behind the scenes. And uh, hopefully one day I do. But why, how, why, why is that you've not been able to come across as a mass leader? You see, I, I don't know. You, you're entitled to your assessment and I have no claims to, uh, uh, to be won. But uh, in my training as a political worker, both outside parliament, in parliament, there's a particular kind of an activity I've got associated with. And therefore, I've confined myself to that activity. In the process, there are sections uh, uh, where you find easier to identify. There are sections, uh, hopefully, as you grow, you'll find easier to identify. But are you at peace with the fact that you will never be a man of the masses? Well, I am not jumping to any conclusion to myself. There is never a last day in the calendar of politics. So you will keep... But is it important for you? The fact but that certainly in the villages... I am... I am, I am you know, let, me, let me say. For example, people watching headlines today, English news, will really know Mr. Jaitley much better than somebody sitting far in the village. Why is that? That you appear to be more of a man of the no, masses... I am equally comfortable on Ajta also. Oh, absolutely. But I am saying... <laughs> <laughs> My question is in terms of how you're perceived by people uh, in rural India vis-a-vis -vis how you're perceived now. Well, it's true that I have not done my politics in rural India. I was born and brought up in Delhi. My politics uh, stemmed out of Delhi itself. And therefore, if people have that impression, it's a legitimate impression to have. But as you grow in politics, you get a lot of opportunities and you get a chance to grow. And hopefully, I do get that. Okay. A gentleman. Mr. it is said that uh, BJP is remote controlled by RSS. So, how do you react to this allegation? Well, you see, these are all phrases which you can use. In democratic uh, uh, politics, a party which has become now a mass party. We are a cadre based party, but we are also a mass organization now. The fact that in eight, nine states, we had state governments, even when we are in opposition, we've had a government in the central uh, part of the government. Therefore, political parties of this kind have to respond to the people. They have to take their own decisions. You can have friendly organizations who you can consult on a lot of subjects. But I can assure you that decisions relating to BJP, its policies, etc. Uh, we consult a lot of people but are taken within the party itself. But why is it then there is such a widespread perception that the BJP is actually remote controlled through Nagpur? That yes, you all are notionally present but the big decisions are taken not by the people sitting at the sun for instance. For instance, I'll tell you, on all policy matters, we take our decision ourselves. Uh, let's take an important stage, parliament is in session. Do you expect a political party, which has such a large presence in parliament, every morning to consult somebody and say, well, what should I do no, today? That's, that's the therefore, workings of the there BJP. Are issues. But on issues of who will be the next president, whether a particular charge of corruption will mean that someone should be I can tell or you, not. On those, I, the RSS is supreme. 
well you can consult anybody you can make people a part of the decision making process even this time i can tell you the final decision when we had a change recently was taken in consultation with a lot of people in the party it was taken out of a meeting which was held in one of my houses itself it was widely reported uh, mr rajgopalan is laughing because uh, he has an office next door to it <laughs> the gentleman in the blue shirt sure. yes yeah my question mr jaitley is why is your party still keeping the people dark about its prime ministerial candidate or is it or is it not going to be mr modi like what seems to me is that you are trying to play a safe see, game the problem is not the problem is like, not with our keeping the party dark the problem is is a certain kind of mindset uh, indian political audiences have developed you see there are two kinds of political parties in india and i want to emphasize this there are parties which have become crowds around a family and therefore the leadership and the next leadership of those parties is known when the next heir apparent is born that he 30 years later will be the leader of the party these are not leaderships on basis of any hard work on basis of any proven ability proven performance or any leadership on basis of uh, actual performance so now these are parties not necessarily a party in the center in the states also you have a large number of parties now in structured political parties whether it's the left parties or the bjp people have to struggle 20 30 40 years before you get into the first row and in any structured party you will have a large number of people now how do you, how, how 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 is it that the two political parties in the united states elect their leader you have primaries in england you have party conferences and then you project a particular shadow prime minister Or, or the leader of the next election, or, or or a presidential candidate. Now you can take it. We have no such systems in India. But when Nirja also just now mentioned that you speak in terms of a galaxy of leadership, I call it the Indian equivalent of the primaries which are on as far as the BJP is concerned. Yeah. And so, you will very soon find. So are you trying you, to play a safe game that once the 2014 election numbers are out, then you will decide it's, it's that, not that if you want to go, see, uh, everybody with Mr. gets Modi. a chance to perform. and finally at the end of the day when the appropriate time comes the best within the system uh, takes over so even when yeah. even when we had the tallest leader in our party unquestionably the tallest uh, mr vajpai it's only on the eve of 1996 that one day mr advani after consulting everybody announced that he is going to be the leader so that's... therefore in our party no but this question is about the suspense around narendra modi why is why? there so much suspense and why, hype around why does it have to be on or... the basis of number of seats why not before why are you not sure of mr modi no we have not said that we will announce it on the basis of the number of seats at an appropriate time the party will certainly announce there is a lot of interest in mr modi i can also see a certain amount of ground swell and that is why uh, probably the media also adds to that interest being built up Therefore, we'll keep all your good suggestions in mind when no, we so decide what, that. No, so what's your take on this? Is it because of media hype, as the Congress believes that there is so much buzz around the name of Mr. Modi? How do you compare it with think, other leaders in the past? I don't think it's uh, merely the media buzz. In fact, when there was a huge media buzz against him, he had the strength to survive by addressing audiences directly over the heads of our style media. There are not many other Indian politicians who have done that, and therefore, after that. to have performed perform extremely well and win three times in a row and even when uh, uh the rest of india was economically not doing so well to continue a single focused uh, 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 attitude uh, 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 emphasis on performance i think he's made a mark and as i said i can actually see a certain amount of interest and that interest is on account of a ground swell at least amongst a certain section of people which is building up okay that lady has it yes yeah, sir so i wanted to ask this question so, sir are you by any case like as uh, it's a rumor that you're already backing uh, mr modi as a pm next uh, election so is it true that uh, you work as a team together well uh, uh, he and i have worked a lot together other, both of you backing each no, other so she is saying that there is this big conspiracy theory Uh, where the seats are divided. If, for example, Mr. Modi gets to about 180, seen, 185, uh, him as a peer. then he's number one, you're number two. If not, well, he, he think, helps uh, you become prime minister. <laughs> he helps you become prime minister with him being in the shadow, backing Arun Jaitley as prime minister. Not in the least. I I'm sure you heard uh, this theory. Well, it hasn't crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you heard the theory. It's come. But what do you make of it? The well, fact. I, I think it's too early to discuss all this. I think uh, the party at an appropriate time will take. Uh, a suitable decision and you don't think in terms of this kind of a planning when you are within the party 
Sir, how do you intend to keep in Nitish Kumar if Modi's name is announced? Well, politics is not about uh, uh, everything coming to you very easily. And I can tell you an illustration I remember uh, in 1989 when Mr. V.P. Singh became the Prime Minister. And therefore, he had to continue as a Prime Minister with the BJP support on one hand and the left parties on the other. And once every week, he used to organize a dinner between the left parties and the BJP to continue in power. So your sister publication, the India Today, came out with a very nice issue saying managing contradictions. Uh -huh. That's the art of governance. And therefore, if you are in politics, you will have to handle these contradictions, these are challenging situations. No, but is the BJP reconciled to the fact that even when Mr. Modi's name is projected... Well, I can only tell you this. Nitish Kumar our experience, will Our experience of NDA has been a very good experience. We would like to see the NDA not only preserved, we'd like to see the NDA expand. And therefore, we work in that direction. So, so, you haven't answered the question. Do you think Nitish Kumar will stay in a dispensation where Modi is at the helm? Or are you reconciled to the fact that well, Nitish Kumar will I am not going walk? to comment on any hypothetical situations. You went to Politics. Bihar, you met Nitish Kumar. Well, I am continuously in touch with him. Yes. And therefore, I have had detailed discussions with him. So, why didn't you tell us and what transpired? Uh, why should I tell you all this and create more problems for myself? <laughs> the lady over there. So many of uh, ministers in your party have criminal charges against them. For uh, charges as in criminal also and other charges also. For example, uh, Mr. Gadkari, who was also the president of your party, he also had some sort of charges against them, him. Will it affect the elections coming up? Well, there are no charges against him. Nobody has filed any case against him. Somebody raised an issue in relation to his business and he said, I am willing for an inquiry. The concerned departments of the government are holding that inquiry. That's about all. She has a follow-up question. Yeah. So, what do you feel about people with criminal charges being able to contest election? I basic, why isn't the opposition doing anything? I'll tell you. You see, there are two, two conflicting views in the, in the politics itself. The first view is that the moment there is a charge framed against you, you must go out of the electoral process. That's, a, that's an ethical view. It has a, a moral, social reasoning behind this particular view. The counter to this is that filing a criminal case is within the jurisdiction of a state government. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in states uh, like UP, Tamil Nadu, now Bengal, which have extremely acrimonious politics, it may be very easy for a ruling party in a state, you just have to file one case, have a charge frame, and then you say the opponent can't contest elections. Now, do we go to a situation like that? So, we've been stuck up in this debate. When I was a law minister in the NDA government, I came out with a middle of the road proposal, which will satisfy the moral conscience of the society at the same time, uh, uh, not to, to at least reduce this policy of misuse. We defined a certain number of offenses as heinous offenses. Now, if you have in two cases charges of heinous offenses against you, you must go out. Now, with this proposal, we went to parliament and regrettably, there was not one political party except our own which was willing to support us on this. And therefore the proposal had to be shelved. No, but she asks an important question about 163 MPs with some form of criminal case See, against now, them. I'll how do we ensure they don't contest the next 163, election? 163, I've also examined it, is a little exaggerated. You may have a case of a political demonstration. You may have a trade union leader with a case against him. The serious issue is those with cases which involve a certain element of moral turpitude, which are not merely cases registered because of political protest. Now, ideally, if there is a serious case, the party should not give them tickets. But then let me appeal to all of you and to people through you. Even when parties make a mistake, people must not vote for them. Okay. Mr. Jaitley, I want to ask you a question about Karnataka. It's the first time a BJP government on its own uh, has, has run a state in southern India. It's about to complete uh, its full term of five years. You've had to change your uh, chief minister. Your former chief minister, Mr. Yedurappa, is fighting against your party today. One of your former ministers, Gali Janathan Reddy, has been in jail for the last 15 months. Are you happy with the performance of the BJP in Karnataka? Well, politically, I was quite happy with the performance. I was in charge of the elections. But also keep one thing in mind. Because we have a sense of accountability, the moment there were allegations, even though he continues to be extremely popular, he continued to be extremely popular, we asked him to leave. We've paid a political cost for it. 
but to pay a political the congress had a chief minister a candidate in himachal pradesh who had allegations far more serious than what were there in karnataka to win the election they made him the head of the party and then made him the chief minister but he suffered a political cost because there were allegations against him you are suggesting that in the coming assembly elections the chances of the bjp returning to power in karnataka are rather remote but we are going to try and uh, uh, do as well as we can okay the gentleman over uh, good evening mr jetley uh, delhi gangrape had you been the uh, law minister what stand would you have taken or what law would you have suggested to justice verma panel point number well, well i think uh, there are many aspects of the justice verma report i read the whole report which are extremely good suggestions there are some issues on which probably the government the opposition and some sections a larger consensus would have to be built up and therefore my suggestion would have been on areas on which almost a near consensus exists and most of those areas there is a near consensus i would go and legislate them immediately without any difficulty and i hope in this session that is legislated if there are some areas one or two areas of difficulty let's not reject them we must refer them to the parliamentary standing committee ask the standing committee in the next 2 to 3 months to consult larger sections of the society do its homework and come out with their legislative proposals as to what is possible with or without any changes uh so just one more question let's say if bjp comes into power will you make cbi independent well my uh, i i have a detailed note which i have given to the parliamentary select yeah, committee yeah. i would prefer it to be independent of the government but if the governments are not willing to make it independent i have made a 10 point formulation on how to immunize cbi from politics and those 10 points which i have said i can go into those details they are all on my website you can uh, actually read them the government the select committee accepted some eight out of those 10 suggestions now i find the cabinet has diluted another two so when the debate takes place in this session of parliament we'll probably get an opportunity to re-emphasize those 10 points no but he's making an important question and you must commit that if going forward the bjp were to form a government will you ensure well, that's exactly what i have said no but will you ensure at that time that the party will actually push this through well i have i have said i have for the uh, complete independence of the cbi on behalf of the party we were three members of the bjp in the select committee under our signatures we given a 10 point proposal how to distance it from the government itself okay uh so the government has enough scams and criminal cases already and uh, safety security poverty corruption is already a major challenge for the government but what assurance can we have that if your party comes to power it will not be corrupt it will be any better and also i'd like to know what measures would you take to tackle these situations and well, to make I'll, the country a better I'll living place i will tell you india needs to eliminate discretions completely because there are discretions available and discretions are exercised by people on top the exercise of discretion involves arbitrariness involves corruption i think we need to streamline our policy that discretions must completely be eliminated and therefore you must have more mechanical exercises in rather than have those discretions secondly when people are involved i just said in an answer to an earlier question you need an investigative me mechanism which is at an arms length away from the government and three the eventual answer is we need to bring in and this is what i feel very strongly about the fear of law into our political system and the fear of law is it's about time that people started going to jails and spending a reasonable amount of time there when they are held guilty of these offenses uh, mr jetley one of the worrying things at the moment is the way disruptions are marking parliament's functioning and actually noise has become the language of parliamentary debate and this is going to discredit the entire political class people are really fed up the way parliament is hijacked you as leader of the opposition your party has said time and again made resolves that we will not go into the well of the house we will not do this that and the other and yet you're back to the same thing as the leader of the opposition what new initiative are you going to take so well, this can Nidia, actually the, be rectified india the first uh, good news is that this session has started without a disruption and therefore hopefully this continues without disruptions but let me tell you running parliament and running it effectively is not the only responsibility of the opposition if the government perpetuates an environment of confrontation let's take an issue 
December 2010, we lost one full session because of disruption on the 2G scam. Now, it's very unfortunate that we lost one, good, one full session of parliament. But, but for that disruption, you wouldn't have had the arrests, you wouldn't have had the charge sheets, you wouldn't have had the JPC, and you wouldn't have had the cancellation of the contracts. You wouldn't have had the Supreme Court uh, taking such a great note of it and jumping into it. Therefore, one of the greatest scandals in recent history got highlighted because the government at times wants you to only talk through an issue for a day and then forget about it. At times, a limited obstructionism also can help you in emphasizing a point. But as far as I am concerned, we obstructionism is never a substitute for a debate. Also, when you say that it brings a bad name, let me tell you, I have seen parliaments functioning all over the world. Serious debates in Indian parliament are almost as good as you have them elsewhere. But they're so rare. They're barely. Why do you why do you make it so rare? Your programs at times become so boring that you switch them off and make people listen to parliamentary debates because the TRPs go up. No, but why is it? Why is it? I dispute why that. Is the it, fact is, the Raul, fact why is it? Why is it that the quality of Indian parliamentary debate is now recognized by news channels that at times you find twenty news channels telecasting the same debate? No, because it's because such a rarity. It. it is such a rarity. It's that is a rare spectacle that it happens. The channels feel happy that someone is debating. No, Parliament is I, doing I what can, it is supposed I to. Can, uh, Ordinarily, everybody is jumping into the well of the house, making a noise, on a and no note, debate happens. I, on a lighter note, I can tell you. That, that even though you may call it a rarity, I enjoy it much more than your nine o'clock debates. Oh, absolutely. We enjoy it, <laughs> we enjoy it much more than the nine o'clock debates and we'd rather have more parliamentary debates. Mr. Okay. Uh, you know, the point is, isn't it possible for people like you and your colleagues to put the government on the mat by a debate and not disruption? But what and makes noise? you think we don't do that? You no, know, you do that, but you let, uh, you know, weeks go by. No, no, but I'll tell you. Actually, not allowing the House to function. Therefore, this is the only way to bring account the government. Therefore, if the government adopts an approach which creates an environment of confrontation, you will find difficulty. Supposing in the 2010 session, the government had said, JPC in the beginning of the session, how many days are lost because you say, I won't allow a debate on price rise. Now, if you don't allow a debate on a voting motion on price rise, or on a voting motion on FDI in retail, parliament is supposed to vote. So, the, how many days have been lost because of the government's uh, 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 insistence of not allowing that? Therefore, governments will have to be reasonable also. There is a space where popular issues, issues of public interest, which are raised by the opposition, time has to be conceded for those debates in parliament. Okay. All right. We're going to leave it over there. Mr. Arun Jitli for participating in the Right to Be Heard Town Hall, for hearing what people want to ask and for answering their questions. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, leader of the opposition, Mr. Arun Jitli. Thank you very much. Thank you.